Okay guys, so three real quick little announcements and then we will jump into the video because that's what YouTubers like to say. We'll jump right into the video. Just three real quick things. Uh, first off, for those of you uh, who have been asking, and I'm sure not everybody has seen uh, the community post a while back, a, a few weeks, I don't know, some time ago about my father being diagnosed with esophageal cancer and you guys are, I'm getting a few comments in the videos, you know, here and there going, hey, what's the update, what's the update? Um, he's finished up his first round of treatments. Right now, we don't know a lot more than that, other than he has finished up his first rounds of treatments, which were a little rough on him, but he's putting some weight back on, and he has surgery scheduled for two weeks from now. So you know pretty much everything that we know at that point, and, uh, and thank you for asking. It means a lot to me, so thank you. Okay, two, for those of you guys who didn't see my community post last week or earlier this week, I don't know when this video is going up, uh, it appears that we have a sneak little preview, peekily do, whatever you want to call it, about uh, Wizards of the Coast's new Dungeons Dragons 5e book that they're launching. And it looks like it's going to be all about Icewind Dale. Now, I'll put the photo in one of these spaces. Um, so here's the deal. It's supposedly this hit D&D Beyond and it was taken down real quick, but nobody's really confirming that hard, hardcore. I imagine that this is probably not photoshopped, but it could be, so there's that. Looks like we're gonna go to Icewind Dale. If you guys are interested in learning about Icewind Dale, I highly recommend uh, jumping in on some Ari Salvatore books because he talks a lot about this. And if you wanna run that campaign, knowing a little bit about 10 towns in that area isn't the worst thing in the world. So I will throw uh, an Amazon affiliate link down to uh, the Crystal Shard. It's technically book four. It's kind of like Star Wars where they start on number four and then they went back and wrote one, two, and three. Uh, yeah, so there's that. If you're gonna get the book, I recommend the audiobook by Victor Bavine. He He's phenomenal. He's awesome to listen to, so there's that. Okay, and then the third thing real fast is that uh, all you folks over on Patreon getting the maps and whatnot, uh, we got our first map from David. It's amazing. And so yeah, there, I'll put a little link up there. You guys should see that later today. And don't forget, uh, starting this month, we're releasing two maps. So David, should be getting me another map soon-ish. And then there's voting happening on next month's map. So go check that out. If you got, don't miss that download is what I'm saying. So thanks patrons. All right, boys and girls. Today we're talking about how to unbalance an encounter. Yes, you heard that right. Unbalancing your encounters, which honestly is kind of like balancing your encounters because you need to know how to balance your encounters in Dungeons and Dragons 5e in order to unbalance your encounters, right? Still with me? Okay, so here's the quick outline for this video. We're gonna talk about what is unbalancing an encounter, why and when you should unbalance an encounter, and how to unbalance said encounters. One last quick note, while I will be making references to some specific Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition things in this video, a lot of the DM tips will be applicable whether you are a DM for D&D or a GM for Pathfinder, Starfinder, etc. Got it? Great? Ready, set, go. First off, let's talk about what exactly I mean by an unbalanced encounter. In short, an unbalanced encounter is an encounter that on paper should be lopsided or an encounter that attacks your character's strengths. Now, you might ask, Cody, did you mean to say attack my character's greatest weaknesses? No, I meant strengths, which admittedly might seem a little strange at first. The reason we unbalance an encounter to attack your party's strengths and not their weakness is something that I once heard the great Michael Irvin say, your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. Yeah, again, a little weird to sprinkle in some sports talk into a Dungeons and Dragons video for a global audience, but let me put this in terms a dungeon master might understand. Let's say your party is excellent at melee combat, but very weak at ranged combat. Attacking their weakness would probably be creating an encounter that the enemy is very good at ranged combat or shoot and run tactics and putting them far away. Attacking their strength would be slapping a few trolls down on the field or putting them up against a rust monster or a remores who will deal damage back to them with each hit. Understand, we've turned the party's reliance on one strategy into their weakness. To go back to another sports analogy, this is the equivalent of Greg Popovich using Donnie Nelson's hack -a shack strategy. You got a seven foot one, 342 pound Hall of Famer that you can't stop from scoring in the post, so screw it. Instead of trying to stop him from getting the ball in his hands, let him. And when he does, slap the crap out of him and send him to the line. He's going to score, but not as many points because he has to shoot free throws instead of being able to just 
dunk after backing an opponent down or putting it up off the glass. But even with a few points here and there, you're also taking away valuable possessions from your opponent, locking them up, doing only the exact thing that you want them to do. In essence, the Sun's strength of getting the ball to a high percentage score on the court turned into their weakness, ultimately leading the Suns to having to take Shaq off the court for more minutes than they expected, which is genius. So to reiterate, the two types of unbalanced encounters are encounters that on paper should be far more than the party can handle and encounters that are overloaded in an area to attack your character's strengths. Now, let's talk a bit about the why and when. For Dungeon Masters that are running long-term campaigns, instead of the occasional one-shot, this will probably be more obvious as you'll have more opportunities to learn how your party takes on combat encounters. Additionally, sometimes it takes even the party a few encounters with new abilities to gel in combat anyway. But what you're looking for is the rhythm or the pattern. Is your party taking on every encounter in the same manner? Fighter moves up to block off the scariest combatant. Rogue or Ranger stays back just far enough to be deadly but not get killed. Cleric bounces between small offensive spells and healing the group up, while the Wizard or Sorcerer stays in the back freely wailing. Over and over again, even when you try to mix up monster types and terrain, etc., then it's time for an unbalanced encounter. Additionally, another reason I might prepare an unbalanced encounter, or to say, an encounter with imbalance, is because I want to let an individual shine or highlight their abilities in combat. One big key that I want to express is the subtlety here with attacking a strength instead of a weakness. Because frankly, it just feels more fair to your players. If you have a barbarian who is resistant while raging to basically everything except psychic damage, and then you start throwing a bunch of psychic monsters at them to attack their weakness, that feels unfair to the player. Odds are they'll probably just think you're trying to personally single them out. It's, it's just not fun. But by putting them up against big, strong enemies that they might be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with in a strength contest, that allows them to use their character in the way they envisioned when they created them. The unbalanced encounter just makes it so that you put them up against something even bigger and tougher than they are. Depending on which character type you are trying to highlight will obviously affect your blueprint for how to best accomplish this with you know healers or targeting uh, ranged dealers, targeting spellcasters, etc. So attack their strengths with high CR encounters to overload it and create that unbalanced encounter there. And the last reason I will use an unbalanced encounter is to stretch and simply challenge my player group. This is basically the example of understanding CR in Dungeons & Dragons 5e and realizing that usually in the right circumstances, the group can take on far, far tougher challenges than they realize if you as the DM understand first how to balance the encounter before you can unbalance it. This is the level 7 group taking on an encounter of CR 16 and coming out the other side of it just fine. Which, before you say, but 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 Cody, a level 7 group could never take on a CR 16 encounter, that's just an exaggerated example. Ah, uh, not true. My Tuesday Night Storm King's Thunder patron group just did that, and the ranger ran out of arrows on round 13 of a 21 round slugfest. But in the end, I think the group had a far better understanding of when to push and when not to, as just two weeks before they almost TPK'd against a CR 10 encounter. And that's the whole point of challenging them. Yeah, though in fairness, a 21 round encounter is probably the only time I've ever had something like that go that far. And part of it is the reason is that they frankly just went too long with player choices, but whatever. You can lead a horse to water, right? All right, so now that you guys understand better what I mean by an unbalanced encounter and when to use this little DM tip, let's talk about how to do it. The very first thing you need to understand is how to assess monsters and NPCs beyond their CR listed in the 5th edition monster manual. Because let me just say, that might be an okay starting point, but I'd warn you not to rely on it too heavily. It definitely skews up, meaning most CRs are listed higher than they probably are, not counting Clark the bugbear, who has probably killed more players than any NPC in the history of D&D. You Fandelver DMs know exactly what I'm talking about. 
Understanding a CR can be broken down into three key elements. The first question you need to ask is, does it attack more than once? <laughs> Before anything else, you need to look at this. The gap between a monster that has multi-attack and one that doesn't is staggering. <laughs> also, look at their stat block and see if they might even make three attacks or if they have legendary or layer actions. All right, let me put it simply. Your group can take on a single higher CR target much easier than three lower CR targets. Yes, that statement is vague without actual examples, but you get my point, okay? I'm not talking about the difference in a Kraken versus three goblins. I'm talking about a CR2 ogre versus a CR one half orc and a couple of one eight kobolds. You know, technically, for a level one party of four, a CR2 Ogre is a deadly encounter with an adjusted XP pool of 450 XP. Comparatively, it would take seven CR18 Kobolds to reach an adjusted XP level of 437 XP. That's to say, 13 less than the Ogre, and which is also considered a deadly encounter. But trust me, that Kobold fight is going to probably end with a couple of dead party members, if not an entire TPK, where that Ogre fight will be tough, might even end up with somebody rolling up a new character but most likely the party could take it on. I mean, one good AC character taking the dodge action each turn to impose disadvantage on the ogre's single attack each round with a bit of healing and range support is absolutely doable at level one. Meanwhile, those kobolds have seven attacks each round with pack tactics and deal a surprising static plus two damage with each successful hit. So on the first round of combat, the ogre could be rolling two dice against the party's highest AC character and taking the lower result, whereas the kobolds will be rolling 12 to 14 dice, depending on their positioning, taking the highest six or seven of those looking for crits and chances to deal double damage. So the first big key to unbalancing your encounters is does it make more than one attack? How many attacks does it make? And that brings us right into our second big key when evaluating monsters is does your monster deal AOE damage or area of effect? AKA, can the monster potentially take down the whole party in one big attack? Now, I am not saying don't include any spellcasters or fire breathers in your unbalanced encounters. What I'm saying is be very, very careful if you do. If we're talking about a normal balanced encounters, go for it. If we're talking about an encounter that on paper should be an insurmountable challenge, Okay, you need to stop and double check your homework. If, if, if you decide to include a monster that can deal out big damage to the entire group, my advice is to do it early. If you wanna include a flame skull in an encounter that is five to six levels higher than the party, throw out that fireball early and let the group recover and change tactics. Am I suggesting cheating the players? Not at all. We're talking about challenging them, but if you're gonna cheat, cheat in the fairest way possible. Yeah, I know what I just said. Now, I do not fudge rolls, ever. I just don't. My players know that and understand that. If their characters die, they die. But what I'm suggesting is, it doesn't matter if you're a master tactician in combat. Sometimes, just like your players at your table, monsters don't always fight in the exact, statistical, perfect, chess-like manner with the help of a top-down view. They can fight well, but they don't always have to be exactly deadly perfect with help of a top-down god assessing the entire battlefield for them. So maybe they don't always see and predict that in two turns the players will bunch up at this corner so I can start positioning now with my bone naga and its lightning bolt to skewer them all perfectly in time. Maybe instead it sees a threat now and just hits the players instinctively because it's a monster. Get it? Okay, now that you understand how to evaluate your monsters to unbalance your encounter, let's talk about three more quick tips. The first is a big one, and that's fighting in waves. I love this little Jedi mind trick because on paper, your players might fight one group of enemies and hear the second group sprinting down the corridor to jump into the battle as well. And it seems like on paper, this is one huge unbalanced encounter that should be impossible for them to survive. But in reality, we're giving them two separate encounters with admittedly the chance for it to snowball on them into an impossible fight if they don't take care of business. Perception is reality. And for dungeon masters that foreshadow the second group's arrival to combat by having someone in the first group blow a horn boom, or shouting down the hallway instead of just being like, well, it's turn five and now five more enemies show up, it'll feel like a more plausible and dangerous situation and feel a lot less like DM Fiat. 
Don't forget though, you are taxing the players and stretching their resources without the time to recover. Warlocks in particular might have a rough time with this, as well as healers that spent slots on offensive spells. Be mindful of action economy though, it's far better for a single big dangerous foe to suddenly come to the aid of the enemies than five to six new attacks and separate targets all bum rushing the field. Is that an offensive term? Bum rushing? I've always said. I hope that's not offensive. That's not offensive. Bum rushing? I should, I should Google that. Which brings me into my next tip, uh, escape routes. In my opinion, it is perfectly acceptable to put the party up against a challenge that is four to five levels too high for them if you give them opportunities to escape. This pairs well with the large combat that ends up being spread out in waves because players have choices to run away or at least attempt to run away. Do what you can to avoid surrounding them with swarms of enemies and try, if you can, to set up the fight in one clean direction and give your players room to run the other way away. Other way away. I said that right. And the final tip I have for running an unbalanced encounter is choice. I would almost never give my players an unavoidable obstacle in any game, really, but especially so for an overloaded, unbalanced encounter that on paper should be a surefire TPK. Do what you need to to foreshadow a large dangerous force. If you give them warnings and it's their choice to engage and they choose not to take your escape route when and if things start to go bad, well, that's just how the game goes. But if you spring a ridiculous encounter on them without any warning and they have no choice but to fight to the death, you know, then that's not really what we're talking about here. Remember, don't cheat. But if you are going to cheat, Cheat as fairly as you can. Unbalanced encounters require player buy-in and a trustworthy DM. So if you decide to use this tool to challenge a group, be just that, be trustworthy. If you pull it all off, your group should be smiling from ear to ear, having the time of their life when the dust finally settles. All right, so now I wanna pass it over to you guys in the community. So you guys have been playing D&D a long time. You've been playing games a long time. I value your opinion here. What are some tips for running very high challenging encounters that on paper should be higher? What are some things to avoid? If you guys are players out there, tell me, what is your, what's your most memorable encounter? The one that just, man, you guys should have died and then uh, you know, Frank did this thing and then we all bamfed out of there and then we killed the queen. Like what is the most extreme encounter you guys have ever survived and lived to tell the tale for? Let us know, I wanna hear it. I of course wanna give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons over at welcomeadventures.com. Guys, you mean so much to me and my family. Thank you so much. I hope you guys truly enjoy the extra little tidbits of maps that we're, we're doing with, with David Hemingway. Um, I think the first one's turned out great and I hope you guys genuinely enjoy the rest of them. If this is your first time here and you love role-playing games as much as I do, I would love to have you subscribe. I put out videos on GM tips, player tips, tutorials, and more, and all kinds of stuff. So if this sounds like something you might be interested in, just hit the subscribe button down below and come join us. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Cody, and may your games be filled with awesome memories and even better friends. I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah.